Well, welcome everybody. I'm sure there will be more people filtering in, but I'd like to just start with a little introduction uh, to give us time to kind of rev up for, for our presentation tonight. Um, so first of all, obviously, I'd like to welcome everybody tonight. Uh, thank you for joining us for a very special presentation. Uh, my name is John Paris. I am the chair of the Native American Studies Committee at College of DuPage in Glen Ellen, Illinois, which is about 20 miles west of Chicago. Um, it is my honor and privilege to welcome you all to tonight's presentation entitled Hear Her Voice, the Issue of Violence Against Native Women and Girls. Before we begin, um, let me first introduce uh, all of those involved in tonight, making tonight possible. First of all, the organization that I'm directly involved in, we are the Native American Studies Committee of College of DuPage. We are one of a number of committees housed in the Global Education Department at COD, what we affectionately call College of DuPage. Um, it is comprised of faculty, students, staff, members of the community. In short, we are really open to everybody who, who is interested in what we do. Um, so if you're interested in joining, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But our committee is dedicated to promoting Native American peoples, culture, history, issues, and provides a forum to facilitate learning and understanding of Native American studies to our community and beyond. We host cultural presentations such as events like this one, trips to various Native-centered locales, museums, historic sites, cultural centers, art galleries, etc., conferences, symposia, community outreach, and we do partner with numerous local Native American organizations in the greater Chicagoland area. Um, to get involved, to join, or just to follow us, you certainly are free to email me uh, as the chair. My name is again John Paris. My email is parisj, Paris just like the city in France with a j, at cod.edu. And my email is on the flyer that many of you are privy to. Um, if you, uh, that's one way to join or get uh, on our email list. You can also follow us or like us on Facebook. We are, it's a long title, but we are College of DuPage Native American Studies Committee. It's long-winded, but we wanted to get all that in there to just identify who we are. Um, and again, if you email me, I can just give you a direct link uh, to our Facebook page. And Mercedes, one of our presenters tonight, is in the process of uh, starting up um, our presence on Twitter and Instagram. So we're going even bigger <laughs> in social love. <laughs> yeah. um, the, um, um, we are partnering tonight with two other entities. One is the COD Speakers Bureau. This is part of their COD Dialogue Over Distance pr a series of presentations uh, facilitated by faculty, staff, and guests throughout this semester. All of these presentations are on Zoom, are free and accessible to the general public. Um, feel free to register and attend all or any of these if you wish. Um, the next ones, the next two that are planned are both on the 2020 election. So kind of timely, right? Um, the next one is called Long Lines, Mail-In Ballots and Election Outcomes, uh, given by COD political science professors David Goldberg and Melissa Moritzen on Tuesday, November 17th at 7 p.m. So that's exactly one week from right now, next Tuesday at 7. Uh, there's also one that they're going to be doing December 15th, which is a Tuesday, Coattails or Chasms, Local Impact of na National Elections, College of DuPage political science professor Melissa Moritzen, William Enright, and Elmhurst University professor Constant Mi Constance Mixon um, on that day. So for information to register, to get the Zoom links, go to the College of DuPage website. It's cod.edu for all of that information. So thank you to the COD Speakers Bureau uh, for uh, including our presentation in that series. Um, and third, and certainly not least, the Prospect Heights Public Library. So welcome to everybody that is coming here from Prospect Heights or from the library. Uh, thank you so much for helping to work with us and making tonight possible. Their website, where you can get information about the library, upcoming news, events, and general library information is www.phpl, Prospect Heights Public Library, phpl.info. Um, so feel free to go there and find out about the library. So thank you again to you folks. Um, a little housekeeping before we begin. Um, tonight's presentation is being recorded, just so that you're all aware. I wanted to put that out there so there's no confusion. Um, we have my, muted everybody's mics for now. Uh, the latter half of the presentation, when we open things up for the questions and answers, our moderator might open up the mics temporarily to allow people to engage in a conversation if the, if the need shall arise. Um, tonight's roughly about an hour. We might go a little bit over, which is fine, but we're planning an hour. Um, the first half, 
will be the presentation by our two main presenters. Um, during this portion, if you'd like to ask questions, please use the chat box and our moderator will be monitoring them and, and bringing those up during the Q&A portion. Um, and then the second half, again, is the Q&A portion. So this is a little bit more of a free form sort of dialogue. Feel free to ask questions in this period too. And if a verbal dialogue is needed, we can open up mics for that. Um, so the, the presenters tonight, the final thing, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet and turn things over. I am John Paris. I'm an associate professor of history and the chair of Native American studies. I will be here primarily as an ally. Um, the, the main presenters tonight are, are uh, the two remarkable women I'm a about to introduce, but I will be here as an ally and also to lend a little bit of support if need be in a historical context as a history professor. Um, our main presenters, Mercedes Reza. Um, she is a current College of DuPage student. She is pursuing a social work degree. She is a very passionate and active member of our Native American Studies Committee, and she is an activist in the movement we're about to describe um, for uh, the advocacy for uh, Native women and girls, especially those that are uh, victims of violence. Um, she, um, so she can tell a little bit more about herself in just a moment, but she's one of our two main presenters. The other main presenter, I am honored to present Rachel Fernandez. She is the executive director of Woodland Women. She is a strong advocate, organizer, activist, and speaker on the issue of uh, violence against Native women and girls. She has been working with victims of domestic and sexual violence while providing advocacy and support services to the Menominee Tribe of Wisconsin for well over a decade. So ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to turn the presentation over to our distinguished panelists, Mercedes and Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Welcome community members, allies, friends, sisters, and brothers. John introduced everyone. I, again, I'm Mercedes. I'm a student at the College of DuPage majoring in human services with respect to the drug and alcohol counseling service. I'm also a mother, a daughter, an aunt, a niece, and a sister. I'm thankful that you are all here with us today. I know we are living in trying times, so I'd like to just take a moment and relax, relax your shoulders, take a breath, and kind of center yourself. I'd like to introduce our other co-host today is Rachel Fernandez. Rachel, would you like to introduce yourself to everyone today? Sure. Um, my went in for, for the introduction, John and Mercedes. Also on SVCN Malkuki, Netotam Oasa. Um, hello. Um, I just introduced myself in my Menominee language. My um, Menominee name is Namalkuki, which means sturgeon woman. My clan is Bear, and I am honored to be here to talk about the epidemic, the important issue of violence against women, children, and how we all can get educated, be allies, and speak for those that can't. And most importantly, advocate, organize, and walk alongside everyone who has been uh, victims of domestic and sexual violence, human trafficking, um, our ancestors, honor our ancestors, and honor, honor those that have been murdered and missing. So I, I, I'm honored to be here and, and to speak on this important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Today we honor our matriarchs. The ghosts of the missing and murdered women and girls refuse to be forgotten. They are our silent guests at every function. In honor of Native American Heritage Month and this past October's Domestic Violence Awareness Month, we gather today for our slain and disappeared sisters who are not with us today. We lift our prayer for the families of the MMIWG and two spirit victims that work tirelessly and advocate for their schools, community, and culture. Please, as we go on with tonight's presentation, respect the sacredness of those who are not able to speak as we are here to speak for them. As I stated in the beginning, I know I've had some difficult time dealing with stress and frustrations 
of homeschooling, online tasks of homework, emails, and just kind of dealing with everything. And I'm sure you are as well. So one of the things I try to remind myself of is about the spirit of the turtle. I was told this by another great Lakota speaker, Brenda Hill, and she's at the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. She said the power of that and some of the lessons of that spirit, the turtle, is to go slow. It's okay to go slow. It's okay to stop and withdraw yourself into a shell. Take care of yourself a little bit, but come back. Come back out of your shell and go as slow as you need to, just as long as you continue that next step. I wanna make sure you all take care of yourselves. As we go through this presentation and follow up discussion, there may be things that are upsetting. You may have memories that create a response. Some people call them triggers. If that happens to you, know that, that it's normal and to do what you need to, to take care of yourself, okay? The other thing I was thinking about before we get started is the fact that we actually have a really nice turnout for this presentation. And again, I thank every one of you that are participating today. I'm sure we're all missing being able to gather in groups and kind of be in class and, and have these dialogues together. But just know that everything is connected. So take a moment to think about how you are connected to several other women, other men who are dedicated to this work and open to gaining some new information. We are all connected in this, so you are never alone. Just be mindful of that. In, in those moments of isolation and the struggle to juggle everything under the circumstances that we are in, and when things get difficult, no, you are not alone. So to begin tonight, I would like to talk about and provide some foundational information and perspective. It's important to set a foundation to understand this balance of violence that we are talking about. It's not natural. That provides us some hope as well. But if we don't understand the causes of extreme levels of violence against women, against Native women in particular, then it can throw off our responses. So one of the questions that we need to ask is given that we know traditionally within our indigenous cultures, we do not have this level of violence of any kind that we are seeing today, and especially against women. How do we get to this place where many of us believe minimally half, if not three quarters or more of native women have been victimized in some way? How do we get to that? If we look at our history, what's happened to us since colonization, I think our answers to that question are right there. I wanna point out that when we are looking at this graphic, that the tac tactics that we are talking about of colonization are the tactics of batterers and other oppressors as well to this day. That red circle in the middle represents the natural world, our indigenous world. And through the genocide and colonization in our history, you can see there's femicide, the outright targeting of women in particular, chemical warfare, like alcohol, smallpox, those kinds of things, and the demonizing of native people in general, but native women in particular. Then we see the isolation of families through the reservation system and boarding schools. And you can go through and identify how those tactics basically create a macro level. You see the big picture. When you're looking at what's happening to women who are being battered and the tactics batterers use, you can translate these tactics into those batterers as well. So all of those tactics brought to bear pressure on that sacred circle, that red sacred circle. And as a result of that unnatural power and control and levels of violence, our world kind of imploded. So a, a result of colonization, that sacred circle became a triangle or an unnatural worldview, as you see in the middle. Whereas in the circle, everything is connected, everything is equal. That's equity, that's cooperation, our interdependence. The triangle represents something else. We'll talk about that in a little bit because the triangle is a very unnatural shape. 
But as a result of colonization in particular, with the impact it had on our belief systems and the inability to practice our cultural ways, speak our language, all of that, you have all these levels and all different types of violence that is shown here. So to look at this triangle, this unnatural shape, it's about our belief system and the unnatural belief that was imposed upon our peoples to take shape of a hierarchy. It's about breaking of relationships, whereas in the natural world, what we know as indigenous people is that we are all related. We impact each other. But in this unnatural world, it's a destruction that comes from the breaking of our relationships, disconnection and violence, and you know, the separation from Mother Earth. The separation between men and women, and very often, you know, we're hearing nowadays is the separation based on the color of our skin, our genders, classism, how much material wealth we may have, and all those kinds of values. So the history of European settlement and the founding of the United States is in a large part a history of persecution to the native people. Through violence, a succession of broken treaties and violation of multiple Supreme Court rulings, the United States government displaced American Indians from the tribal lands. As I stated, the tactics of oppression and colonization and intimate partner violence are near the same. The main goal is power and control over others and attaining personal status. Men are not born violent and women are not born to be submissive. It's part of our work as advocates to understand all of those dynamics and how it impacts us as individuals and in our relationships. I think it's really important if you're aware of all the statistics and what's going on in our world and you find that it's just disheartening. We need to gather hope and guidance from our ancestors, from our indigenous cultures, remembering that as much as what has happened to us was possible, that trauma is in our DNA. So our ability to be resilient and remember those lessons, to remember that violence against women, children, and against men even, was extremely rare before colonization. And the consequences were immediate and severe. You know, women, children, elders were safe. It's about looking at our culture, our life ways, and our beliefs, and how we practice in ways that reflect our original and natural beliefs. So a few statistics to share with you all, and then we will hear from Rachel and her experiences. American Indian and Alaska Native women experienced extremely high rates of domestic violence, physical and sexual assault and murder than any women in, than any other women of other ethnicities. Many women do not report violence for a variety of reasons. Many tribes have inadequate or no law enforcement to report these crimes to. In small isolated communities, Victims fear retribution from their perpetrators, per perpetrators' friends and family. Although the federal government recognizes 566 tribes in the United States, there are only 26 shelters nationwide that provide specifically uh, cultural specific services to American Indian and Alaska Native victims and survivors. According to the 2016 National Institute of Justice study of violence against American Indian and Alaska Native women and men, more than four in five women or 84% of Native women have experienced violence in their lifetime. This includes 56% who've experienced sexual violence, 55.5% who've experienced physical violence by an intimate partner, 48.8% who have experienced stalking, and 66.4% who have experienced psychological aggression by an intimate partner. Overall, more than 1.5 million American Indian and Alaska Native women have experienced violence in their lifetime. Many Native women never speak about their abuse because they see it as futile. They believe no one can or will help them. Rachel, I again like to thank you for coming into the discussion. Can you please share some of your experiences working with women and survivors?
who didn't disclose their abuse for years or even into decades and why they choose to keep this to themselves? Yes. Um, so I'm going to give a little background on, on myself. Um, I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor of sexual violence, um, suicide attempt survivor, um, domestic violence, um, and a survivor and thriver of oppression. Um, so I started in victim services and advocacy um, more than 10 years ago. And uh, I started in our shelter that we have here on, I'm from the Menominee Indian Reservation in Wisconsin. And um, we have a shelter here for domestic violence and um, sexual assault survivors. And that's where I started my work. I had great mentorship um, from a few people back then. And I felt this was my purpose. This was my calling because of what I went through. I felt like I could help others. And that's what I've been doing. So uh, working at the shelter, I, I've helped um, everyone. I've, I've helped males. I've helped two-spirit um, elders, our children, our women. And through that experience, I've, I, I always noticed how we come together around our women. And sometimes our children are left to the side. Um, and, I, and I really think that um, advocating for them is important because we want to break cycles. So um, working at the shelter was a great experience. And it really made connection to a lot of people in our community and our surrounding communities because we would get a lot of people coming in that are fleeing. And then I, um, I transferred to uh, Crime Victims, the Crime Victims Program, and I worked there for a while. And, and under a grant that we had, um, there, were, there was supposed to be a support group for our, our survivors of, of crime, our victims of crime. And that wasn't happening. So I did start, uh, this is grassroots on my own, around sitting around my, my, uh, my kitchen table with my aunt and some other family and some friends. And we started beating and we started talking about stories um, of our grandmas, of our aunties, and we started that, and it evolved. And let's see, seven. It's going. It's going to be coming up on seven years later. We have evolved to our elders teaching us. And um, one story I want to share, which I got permission to share from my elder, is um, through meeting weekly with our women in our community. Um, and then providing uh, safe spaces for healing, for sharing, talking circles, retreats. Um, we did Mending Broken Hearts for our elders. Um, that was through a, a tribal program, but we continued on meeting with support uh, through Woodland Women's Group. And one of the stories that was shared was that um, my elder which I hold near and dear to my heart. Uh, she shared that it was her first time talking about her abuse when she was in um, Catholic school, because we had, we had boarding schools where our, our children were stolen from our families and taken to boarding schools and stripped of their identity. And then we had the Catholic schools. We had uh, one in Neopit in our community and one in Kashina in our community. And my elder went to the one in Neopit and um, she said, some, you know, she was, she was assaulted, she was sexually assaulted and she um, finally spoke of it. She's in her seventies now and she spoke of that. And 
she credited that that safe space to all of us being together all the, all of the time meeting weekly and she felt safe enough to disclose that to us and again she gave me permission to to tell this story um but she is one of our biggest teachers our greatest supporters of coming back to our language to our cultural teachings our stories she has many, many stories to share. And so um, I feel that connection, if we have connection to who we are, where we come from, and where we are going, we are going to come, come out of this on top. And, and we are doing it. We are breaking cycles. But we need continued support from one another. And we also need support from allies we need those allies that will stand with us not stand in front of us those allies that will not take over the table that we're sitting at those allies that are waiting for us to invite them to that table and we we need to honor our ancestors we need to honor those that endured and suffered in, in most horrific ways for us to be here. So that's, that's kind of, I, I have a lot to say, but that's kind of what I, um, what I do, what I've been doing. And I think um, we have a lot of work to do yet, but it's coming along and and I think with, you know, the boom on social media, because this has always been here, like you said before, Mercedes, about, you know, this has been here since colonization. We, we have, we, this is what we know. There are a lot of people out there that don't think that we exist yet. There are a lot of people that think, okay, if they exist, they must um, live in teepees and, you know, we, like we, we are not citizens of this land and we are and we have been this is our land this is our land that everyone is on and i think honoring that part and the connection that we have to our first mother i think that's important to honor her um i i fight for land air and water and that's the that's the connection to everything when we think about um fighting against you know, gender-based violence, violence against our women, children, and elders. It's all interconnected. Everything is interconnected, and it comes right down to our mother and honoring our first mother, Mother Earth. And speaking, speaking our truth to power, speaking our truths, our stories, and what has happened is not only healing us, it's healing our ancestors. So um, I think it's important that going forward, we, we have those allies, we have that honoring, we have that remembrance. <clears throat> we have that remembrance of, of our ancestors and honoring them. I agree, Rachel. I definitely agree. And especially with regard to the awareness that we have come across nowadays. I mean, over the last decade, awareness of the MMIW movement has increased due to social media, has increased due to activism and awareness. But at the same time, as you stated, there's something more that needs to be done at all levels for the stopping of, of the disappearances and to save lives. This is a national level epidemic. And it's not only affected this generation, it has affected generations of women and girls since colonization. And in the United States, uh, indigenous women are twice as likely to go missing than white American women, even though they make up a familiar small percentage of that population. In many parts of the country, indigenous women are 10 times more likely to be murdered compared to the rest of the population. Despite the prevalence of violent crimes, these cases have a low prosecution rate. Between lack of tribal resources 
jurisdictional conflicts, substance abuse, and racist conflict in border towns. Native Americans are murdered or go missing at alarmingly high rates with few cases resolved. Crimes against indigenous people are underreported. And when they are reported, they are often insufficiently investigated. In other words, non-natives commit crimes against indigenous women because they know there's a high chance they will not get caught. Mm -hmm. Data that is collected is a great influence for the studies of modern day Native American culture. It, great, it gives great insight to the diversity of Native people and how image is catastrophic and influences stereotypes, not only in the Native community, but to communities with people of color. Issues of color and race bias communities, and there's a number of well-intentioned but ill-informed people who take up causes without the proper knowledge, tools, and skills. Due to limited resources available to victimize Native women and mishandling of data collection, many cases go underreported and become uh, lost. This is also due to the lack of empathy from the police officers who would be reporting these crimes. The image of a Native woman wearing a ribbon skirt here represents the sacredness of American Indian and Alaska Native women and the deep connection their bodies and spirits have to the land. The Urban Indian Health Institute identified 506 unique cases of MMIWG across 71 selected cities. 128 were missing persons cases, 280 were murder cases, and 98 had unknown status. The youngest victim was less than a year old, and the oldest victim was an elder who was 83. The median age of a victim is between 29 years old. The extreme diversity in cultural Social, cultural, and economic conditions between tribal nations, as well as among Native women residing in larger non-reservation communities, make it difficult to estimate the overall rates of violence against Native women. Activists argue that a legacy of racism in a country that devalues Native lives is limiting the attention and resources needed to confront a silent epidemic. A lack of funding, both for law enforcement and victims, along with poor criminal and demographic data collection, means that those who disappear may not even get the luxury of becoming a statistic. Disappearances go unsolved and deaths go uncounted. We're gonna go into hearing her story. These amazing women had their life interrupted or ended, but their voices will not be silenced. We will let the world know about them Ariel Begay was 26 years old when she was reported missing. She was last seen July 3rd, 2017 on the Navajo Nation. Months went by as her family asked and searched for answers. When they attempted their own search of Ariel, they were told to stop as they might disturb evidence. Many cases go unsolved like this one because of the remoteness on the reservation and a lack of investigative resources. If anyone has any information about Ariel's case, should call the Gallup FBI. I've provided a phone number. Sherry Ann Woundedfoot. Sherry was 50 years old when she was found beaten unconscious outside a building in White Clay, Nebraska. On August 5th, 2016, she would die a couple weeks later in the hospital from blunt force trauma to her head. Her death was ruled a potential homicide, but no arrests have ever been made in connection with Sherry's death. Activists have used Sherry's murder as an example of why alcohol sales should not be allowed in white clay. White clay sells around 4 million cans of beer a year, primarily, primarily to the nearby Pine Ridge Reservation, which is legally dry, which means alcohol is not allowed on the reservation. Sherry and many others from her reservation traveled to White Clay to drink or buy alcohol. Sherry was a mother of three and had lost her brother in the same way not long before her death. 
May Sherry rest in peace and justice find her killers. Savannah LaFontaine Graywin. Savannah was 22 years old and eight months pregnant when she vanished from Fargo, North Dakota on August 19, 2017. Savannah's family reported that it was unlike her to go without contact for so long. Savannah left her apartment to visit a neighbor who needed a model for a dress fitting. She had just ordered a pizza that she never returned to eat. Her wallet was also left behind, so Savannah was planning on coming back and driving her brother to school at three. When her family checked with her neighbor, the neighbor stated that they weren't finished completing the dress, so Savannah's mom gave her brother a lift. When they checked on Savannah later, the neighbor reported Savannah had left. According to family, Savannah's, were feet, Savannah's feet were swollen because she was pregnant. When police were called, police made the assumptions that she was out drinking and partying and she would return on her own time. The local authorities did not put enough effort into finding her. She was found wrapped in plastic and dumped in the Red River. Two arrests were made on August 24, 2017, when Savannah's newborn was found in the custody of the couple that had visited her for the model fitting. They lived in the apartment right above hers. Due to Savannah's disappearance, Savannah's law was enacted it recently became law on October 10, 2020. This bill directs the Department of Justice to review, revise, and develop law enforcement and justice protocols to address missing and murdered Native Americans. Savannah's case is only a few of more than 20,000 unreported cases since the online database began in 2015 through Sovereign <coughs> Bodies. The crimes against Indigenous people are underreported and insufficient insufficiently investigated. Again, as I bring up Savannah's law, this is something that just was enacted as a law on October 10th, 2020. Just last year, um, President Trump signed an executive order to establish a federal task force to address the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women. To him, it was an issue that must be acknowledged. He said in quote, it's a tremendous problem. It's been going on for a long time, many, many decades beyond that. And we're going to address it. We will leverage every resource we have to bring safely, bring safety to our tribal communities and we will not waver in this mission. We're taking this very seriously. I'm hoping that his words will continue on into our next presidency as our women and children and men who are missing don't go and be forgotten. No more stolen sisters. We need action. Now, as we go into this, how can we honor our missing and murdered? What can we do? These results should raise awareness in itself and it should create an understanding of violence against American Indian and Alaska Native victims. They also highlight the continued need for services for American Indians and victims of crime. It also highlights the need for ongoing grassroots advocacy and changes to laws, policies, and increased allocation of resources to end these injustices. Individuals and or joint actions at the local, tribal, state, national and international levels are needed this year. The issues surrounding our missing must be brought into the public's awareness. And that's why we are here today. We need people that are, that are in need. They need someone to talk to. As Rachel stated, sometimes we need to create these safe places for our victims to, to disclose. Sometimes, especially right now in a time of a pandemic where we cannot gather together, we cannot reach out. This is a time where we need the most action. We need the most advocacy. Public statements honoring and calling for justice for MMIWG can also serve as statements of support for those who are suffering from abuse and violence. 
Turning our grief to action, we as allies must call upon Congress as well. We can support in many ways by educating ourselves and our community and also donating to those that serve the communities that are hurting. I've listed several places, Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women, the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, Sovereign Bodies Institute, Rachel Fernandez's Woodland Women, and MMIW USA are all great points to educate and cultivate and strengthen our ability to advocate. I have provided several resources for our community in the event that you are going through something, if you are in need of help, if you are in trouble, please reach out. These resources are available in our community and are nationally available as well. If you need any more time for these, please let us know in the chat box and I will be more than happy to come back to it. As well, I provided the National Suicide Prevention Line, the Crisis Text Line, and the Talk Help Line. In Illinois, we are facing a lot of homelessness because of the pandemic. So I provided a phone number and a hotline to get in touch with Entry Point, Illinois. Additional services and victim services can be found at the online directory. If you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat box now. Rachel, I'd like to ask you as well, how else can we honor our missing and murdered sisters? Keep speaking their names, telling the stories, be mindful of their families if that's what they want. Um, it's not about us, it's about them. Uh, my experience has been to always honor them in that way, honor their families in that way, be respectful, be mindful. Um, we, have to, we have to reaffirm that support for them, for those that have been murdered, those that are missing, um, their families, they need support. We need to honor them by speaking their names and, and making sure that they're not forgotten. It's so easily to be forgotten in a world where we're already oppressed. And I wanted to share that um, one of my families that I've been helping, uh, the family of Ray Turtlelot, <clears throat> they reminded me the other day because I always ask them for permission for everything. Um, because it's, it's not my story, but I always ask them permission. And they reminded me that they don't want her forgotten. They want, they want people to know that this happened and that we need justice for her. We need justice for everyone that has been murdered, everyone that is missing. We need that justice. We need to reaffirm that tribal sovereignty to support those families we need the support the we need that support for our tribal justice systems we need to increase our data and transparency you know you talked about you know when when a non-native goes missing they get media attention right away we do not we don't get that we go on social media and that's how we pass the word that's how we get our um, stories told and I think <clears throat> excuse me I think it's important that we we also acknowledge that lateral oppression in our communities um, yes we have non-natives that that are perpetrators and that offend and but we also have la that lateral oppression we know there are people out there in our community that knows what happened to, to Ray? We know there are people out in our community that knows what happened to Caitlin Kelly. We know there are people out there that knows what happened to Robert Lyons. We know that there are people out there that knows what happened to
to Lisa Ninham. We know across Indian country, we know our own people don't tell those stories. Our own people don't come forward to bring some kind of comfort to our families that are enduring this pain. We know this and it needs to stop. We have enough dealing with oppression from outside, always attacking us. We need our own people to step up. We need them to step up to the plate and tell these stories. And it's not only for those families, it's for the person that was murdered or missing. We need that. We need, we need our people to tell what happened. We need to increase safety on, on our tribal lands. Um, when we talk about violence against women, children, and elderly, we need that. And with, with Ray's story, um, when her family reported her missing, that's exactly the response they got was, oh, she's probably out drinking and, you know, she probably needed a break because she, she just had a baby. She just had a little girl. She was a, about a month old. And her family knew better. And they went out looking for her. Just like all of these families across our nation, our Indian country, um, do. When they don't get that support, that help, that belief, nobody believes. They go out and they do it themselves. And, and that is wrong. We need increased safety on our lands. Rachel, we have a question from one of our viewers. Sure. Let's As see. To what you're speaking to right now. Uh, do you think law enforcement and investigators are biased against victims because of their identities and maybe don't pursue investigations with full attention? Can awareness put more pressure on the people investigating or do people who have information and can tell those stories feel like going to an investigator is a threatening thing for themselves? Oh, absolutely. I think awareness, we need more awareness. We need we need people to talk. We need people to speak. We need people to stand up for those that can't. You know, some of our families, they, they just give up. You know, they're not getting what they need, what we should be giving them, as in like law enforcement. Um, you know, you talk about the database. Uh, some of the things that I learned was, you know, for urban natives and stuff, we're not on that report. Mm -hmm. We we're other, mm -hmm. and and that's that's something else too. With just imagine, you know, you, you put out the statistics, but just imagine those statistics of those that we don't know of, those that we have no idea of. You talk about human trafficking, homelessness, foster care system, the boarding schools. Um, substance use, you, you tie everything, everything is interconnected, but we're not acknowledged. And that's a big problem. That's always been a big problem for me that we are not acknowledged in that way, the way everybody else is acknowledged. I mean, we're human and we're the first inhabitants of this land. So I, I definitely think that more awareness people telling these stories and educating others. When you overhear a conversation, I've been there where you overhear a conversation of people talking about, Oh, this and that, you know, about a, somebody that was missing a native person that's missing. And then they go into this stigma. Oh, you know, that happens just on the reservations or um, they drink a lot, you know, and, and stuff like that. Like, this is what we are. No, this is not who we are. We always held women as sacred. Violence is never our tradition. But because of assimilation, colonization, this has been brought to us, and this is what we have learned. And um, it's time to break those cycles. It's time to speak our truth to power 
and it's time to have some allies that that support us in that good way and don't speak for us no don't speak for us you uplift us you empower us and you bring us to those spaces where we can we can speak for ourselves but keep telling everybody about you know what's going on keep keep saying their names Mm -hmm. because it's not only women um you know it's our men it's our children to spirit it's it's everyone but we're just not acknowledged in that way going to what you just said we have another couple questions um what would you like to see from your communities and how can allies be the types of allies you'd seek and the second part of that is what would you think uh what do you most want college students to know and how can they play a positive role in contributing to the solution as they go out and become our future social workers justice studies professionals doctors nurses etc so what do you want from the allies and what do you want college students to know i i would like to see everybody learn learn about us and if you don't ask some of us ask me you have my information you know ask me uh, and if i don't know i go to my elder that's what we're taught you go to your elders for that wisdom and those stories and those teachings but yes please get educated um if you don't know anything then don't say anything at all you know um but be of support to to us and acknowledge us because we're here we've always been here we're not going anywhere and um let's see yeah for the for the um for the college students yes please just learn more and don't be a part of that um that bias you know i know a lot of people um make jokes and stuff that's part of the problem that's part of the problem you know and we could go into so much like mascots we could go into all kinds of things um but i do want to acknowledge um the boarding school era and a lot of it came from there a lot of our traumas that were passed down and mercedes was talking about it's in our dna yes it's in our dna and i always talk about this with our youth you see our youth in our communities or or you know in the urban areas and they're they're angry they don't know why they don't know they don't understand why they're so angry and it's because of that that is passed down intergenerationally that historical trauma is passed down in our dna and it's there's there's a lot of healing that needs to come of it just like uh, the elder that i spoke of she was finally able to heal from that era and and she was finally able to speak she was finally able to speak isn't that amazing and can you imagine you know all of the elders out there that need that and all of our children that need that all of us that need that that healing because we're told you know oh just let it go or get over it no it's not something that you can get over it's a it's a healing and it's a connection that we need in order to heal i have another question here um do you believe that the way to decolonize oneself can you answer that i I talk with um a few of my elders on this and they always encourage to learn your language to learn who you are learn where you come from who's your family where you know we're not all 100% native american there's you know there there are some out there but um because of that colonization and assimilation we we ha- our our histories are you know we we could be french we could be you know there's we should be learning who we are where we come from because when once you connect to to who you are you 
you have a better connection with everybody else. And um, learning your language, learning your cultural teachings. Um, and I can't stress it enough. Talk to your elders. Talk to your elders. They're the greatest teachers of all. This question is either for you or for um, Mercedes. Any idea on the extent to human trafficking taken on uh, women and girls? Uh, human trafficking through the Native American um, communities? Um, I was telling Mercedes um, a few days ago about a story, and I got permission to, to share this story also. One of my mentors, she, um, this was years ago. Um, she's a facilitator and one of her, one of her daughters, they live in Minneapolis and one of her daughters went to a, um, her and her friends went to a mall and they were um, basically kidnapped by a gang and drugged and, and taken. So, um, when we talk about human trafficking, it's it can be something as quick as that, or it could be our substance abuse. It could be our foster care system. You know, we've we've heard a lot about our foster care system and how people use that for trafficking. We've heard a lot about substance abuse and how, you know, if we're if we're taking off layers of trauma and how that plays into trafficking because if if you have trauma and you're not resolving that if you're not you know trying to to heal or cope in a good way you're going to use other ways of of coping and substance use is one of them and that that is a gateway to human trafficking because once you're addicted you're you're going to do whatever you can to get you know, your drugs. And that's a gateway also. Um, so there's, there's many layers to um, MMIW, trafficking, domestic violence. Domestic violence, people don't really realize. They think, okay, this is something that happens at home. But, you know, there are instances where the person that's being the, that's the abuser is trafficking that person also in their home. So it, there are so many layers to trauma and how everything is so connected in the same, in the same way. We have a comment from one of our viewers. Uh, judicial policy needs to change on the reservation where non-natives can be charged for crimes. I'm reading this and I'm amazed. I did not realize that if I went on a reservation as a non-native and I committed a crime, I'm not going to be charged. Yeah. The, you know, um, they have VAWA, so Violence Against Women Act. Um, they have that, but, but it hasn't, it hasn't been um, reauthorized. Um, when we talk about um, crimes against um, natives on native land um, from non-natives. Yeah, it's it's more prevalent because that's uh, it's an easy out from be, from getting prosecuted. Although you have the federal federal gov government that that works um, works with our tribal governments. Um, we have the, um, I'm trying to think, because our Menominee Reservation is, is not a PL-280 um, state, we're, we're sovereign. We don't, um, we are total federal, we are not state. So the other tribes in our state, they work with state when it comes to crimes and everything, but our our tribe, we don't because we are, we are sovereign. We were terminated in the 50s, and then we fought back to, to bring, you know, to bring our, our 
um, try back in the 70s. And um, so when we were when we were brought back, you know, we 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 are a sovereign state. We are like a, a our own within the state. So we we prosecute, but we there's only certain um, it only we have our own laws, but the federal government takes over if the um, if the crime is severe. Um, we have one question for uh, Mercedes. What happened to Savannah's baby? Yes, Savannah's baby um, survived. Um, she was actually taken from Savannah when Savannah was still alive. So because of that, the baby survived. Um, after the two people were arrested, they did a DNA test to see if the baby was Savannah's, in which it was. And they gave custody to the father, and the father is raising her. She's, I believe, um, three now. She's healthy, and she's um, living her life with her dad. So that's where she is right now. Um, we have two more questions. Uh, actually, we have a comment. Uh, the attendees were asked to uh, please look up the advocate organizations mentioned by Mercedes in this discussion and get involved with them to help the work. Uh, but we do have a question here too. She's an ally and she would like to know if there are any resources provided, um, if the resources you provided give local information as well because she'd like to help on the bigger scale of things and awareness, but also on the local level. Mercedes, Anything local? Before you begin, can you, yeah, I was going to ask if you could move it back so that everybody could see the different organizations. Okay. Of course. Yes, definitely. I'll go on to this one first. These are the ones, uh, these organizations uh, give more education and advocacy uh, toolkits, and they give more of the uh, background information that I have given today. Um, they do not provide uh, direct services. I will put, point that out right now. But if you go onto their websites, they can direct you to other services if you are in need. Now, um, these other resources that I put with the, the hotlines, those are based on um, intake. And once you go into your intake and you speak to someone, they will be able to provide you with the resources that you are in need of. So if you are um, experiencing domestic violence, Please call 1-800-799-7233. If you are experiencing sexual assault and would like to speak to someone regarding that, please call 1-800-656-4673. Mercedes, do you have, um, Mercedes or Rachel, do you have religious worship centers to teach good morals and for healing and meditation to teach for right path and feel justice? Are there places where uh, we can go as allies to learn these cultural distinctions? I don't personally know any, but if Rachel, do you do, you can more than welcome to respond. Um, I am, I am not, uh, I don't affiliate with, with any religion. The things that I, I do, and I know a lot of a lot of um, Indian country does is they they do have their certain um, I guess you would say religion or their spiritual practices. Um, we have life ways, you know, um, but um, the religious worship centers. I I I. I am not an advocate for them just because of the, and that's my personal, that's my personal feeling just because of the historical trauma that happened to our people. Um, so that I, I really don't have anything for that besides, um, um, you know, teaching our life ways. Mm -hmm which we've, we've been doing. 
Okay, perhaps that's what this um, question is asking, if there is a, uh, a center or something online that perhaps would teach more of the spiritual, the life path that you could take. When we were talking about the way of the turtle, mm. that type oh, of... Yes, that would be more uh, at the NIWRC, the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. Brenda Hill is a Lakota speaker and she has lots of webinars as well that she's provided on the website. Um, she speaks a lot about the lifeways um, and the sacred circle in her, um, her speaking events. So if you go onto their website, they have a bunch of links and a bunch of other uh, webinars that they did in the past that speaks on that. Um, go on the website and check it out. That's as far as I can lead you to that. Okay, um, we have another question. Um, do you or have you thought of doing anything as far as getting together with some organizations and possibly having uh, pamphlets passed out, uh, for example, YWCA and schools that you could possibly be a guest speaker at schools? For either of us, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is something uh, that I advocate for. I have been advocating for. Uh, domestic violence has been prevalent in not only my life, but the life of my mother and my grandmother. So in order for us as Rachel states to break that cycle, we need to educate ourselves. And when we educate ourselves, we, we are able to access these skills and these tools to be able to lead us in a way that helps us and gets us out of this cycle. And um, I'm only a student. I have been a student for the last couple of years and I'm learning about a lot of the social work aspects of helping people and finding that being an advocate and using our voice for change can lead to greater uh, a greater good in our community. So uh, in regard to creating pamphlets and speaking, I'm all for that. I, I'm for the movement. I'm about it because there's no other way that we will be able to raise this awareness unless we speak, unless we speak about it and we teach others of what's happening. And this includes, I mean, in any, um, any social change in our communities. We, we hear about you know, the election, we hear about homelessness, we hear about um, the pandemic. And that was a big, a big point for tonight was the effects the pandemic has had on the native communities as well. And a lot of us have faced uh, job insecurities. A lot of us has faced um, troubles, you know, at home with our partners. And again, this panel tonight was to raise that awareness that you are not alone in this fight. And if you are in need of help, please reach out to someone because there is someone willing and waiting to hear you. Thank you. Um, we have had a couple guests um, or uh, a audience members say that there's lots of Zooms like the one that we have right now available. And you can also search the web um, and Facebook for MMIW information. Uh, we have one more question, actually two more. Um, what advice would you give to those who know of domestic violence in a family member's home or the, a friend's home? And what should they do to help prevent in a preventative way? Are there resources and strategies for these uh, people to look for from the outside. One thing that I I want to speak, I, I'd like to speak to that. One thing that I feel is important is to believe them. Mm -hmm. If someone's telling you something, they're trusting you with information that could possibly save their life. So believe someone when they're telling you that um, they're being abused or, you know, something like that is going on sexually, you know, um, but believe them and then and listen you a lot of people when they're trying to help they listen to respond sometimes you just need to listen and be understanding and show that compassion in that good way because maybe that person isn't ready for for you know to report 
or to to um you know leave because we all know well not everybody but um statistics show that that it's the most dangerous time is when someone wants to leave a relationship a violent relationship so believing them and then if they want if they want help you know safety plan with them you know it could be just okay if if you're in this situation um you can call me or you can text me and text the word pizza or something you know <coughs> excuse me <coughs> Ooh. had you talk in a long time sorry rachel <laughs> Um, I have noticed that some people have asked about this program. We will, we are recording this. It will be available on the COD YouTube channel as well as the Dialogue Over Distance webpage. And that would be www.cod.edu slash experts. And you'll be able to see all the archived um, videos that we have going right now. Um, so thank you for asking that. Uh, we do have <coughs> couple other questions here Let's see sorry about that <laughs> no worries I had, we had Ooh. you talking a long time you got to get <laughs> sometimes but this has been very very good information um we do have someone who's just asked or mentioned that we should uh speak with chantelle Bran branch uh, she attends COD as well. I think both the speakers should get in touch with her, uh, know what's going on with the Native Americans and the fearless future uh, that's geared toward domestic violence. Um, and then I'm going to ask Rachel to again look into the chat box because I cannot speak um, Menominee. <laughs> oh. Our friend Rich can. <laughs> so. <laughs> He's um, match where I want in. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that means uh, big thanks. All right. Very good. We have run over a little bit. It's um, 812, but if there's any other questions, I know we have lots of thank yous here. Um, but I want to thank you as well from College of DuPage, the Speakers Bureau. Uh, this has been wonderful information and thank you for sharing your personal stories. Um, it's frightening. I know that there's far more going on in urban areas because you don't, uh, Native Americans aren't visible when they get to an a, um, urban area. And I know that the culture is different as well. But thanks so much for sharing. Uh, John, I'm handing it off to you. Oh, I don't know what else I can say other than a huge uh, thank you to both of our presenters. Um, uh, the information you gave us and the insight you gave us is so invaluable. And um, um, thank you so much for the work you do. Um, it, it's, it's very gratifying when you hear about these tragedies and, and this epidemic of violence that's, as, as Mercedes said, is made worse by the pandemic. Um, that there are people that care, that people that, that are devoting themselves to this crusade, and that there's hope. And I think that was the big takeaway uh, that I got from hearing both of you, that there's hope uh, and simply just speaking your voice and, and allowing uh, victims and their advocates and their allies to speak their voices, uh, I think is a crucial first step that a lot of people have not uh, really come aware uh, to. So thank you so very much. Again, I want to thank everyone that participated tonight. And uh, if you see something, say something, please. No, you are not alone. We're always here to ask, answer your questions. If you have more questions, please send us an email and we'll get back to you. Thank you to Prospect Heights Library again for hosting us tonight. College of DuPage uh, Speakers Bureau. Joan, thank you as well for moderating tonight. And John. <laughs> And a special thanks to Rachel Fernandez. We appreciate your work that you do for the community and the Menominee tribe and everyone around you. Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, thank course. you for listening. <laughs>
We will all take care of yourselves. I just posted a few links uh, to some of the things I mentioned in my introduction, including um, the Speakers Bureau uh, link that uh, Joan just mentioned, and our Facebook page for uh, College of DuPage Native American Studies Committee, because we will be putting on uh, next semester other presentations, uh, uh, probably on Zoom like this. Um, so feel free to like us, check us out. And um, again, thank you again very much, everybody. This is just a, an amazing, experience of learning and of, um, it was sobering but at the same time it was filled with hope at least that there's people like you out there so thank you